I don't know about you, but when it comes to learning how to compose for the orchestra, it is both absolutely mind-boggling, the creative opportunities we have in front of us, and also incredibly terrifying, the immense number of skills it seems we need to have in order to produce something that's worth listening to, let alone all of the marketing and branding it takes to try and grow in the industry. It seems really daunting. So I'm going to do my best in one video to give you four categories of things that you should practice on, four skills, which every other skill falls under, to help organize this. I want to give you the four things that you need to practice because it is almost impossible, particularly in the beginning, to know where to start and to know whether or not what you're doing is actually worth your time or whether or not you're just wasting your time. So then you don't actually end up focusing too much on what you're doing and you do one thing one day, one thing the next day, one thing the, the other day, you open up your DAW every day and then nothing happens, you never finish anything and you never feel like you're never getting anywhere. And that feeling is demoralizing and frankly, it just sucks. Everyone goes through it on some level, no matter how good you are at this thing, everyone deals with writer's block, but particularly in the beginning, having a sort of syllabus, if you will, knowing how to spend your time, how to practice, is going to be a game changer for you. I, th I really do think it will be. And so my goal in making this video is to start a sort of community of like people who are maybe feel shy, feel nervous about the fact that they're beginners, don't want to ask questions that they think maybe are stupid, maybe, you know, everyone knows, they assume everyone knows this, you know, that kind of thing. I want people to have access to the ideas of what you need to learn. And the reason I want to do this is because for two years now, I have been doing just film music pretty much in my free time. And there's so much content online, it's remarkable. There are these awesome tutorials, but for so long, I found myself always questioning whether or not I was really making progress and whether or not it was really worth my time to sit down and watch a 45 minute video if it was just someone composing and, I, and they weren't taking the time to explain what they were doing harmonically, to explain what they were doing, uh, you know, orchestrate, orchestration wise. So on that note, I am not going to, in this video, treat this like a tutorial. This is not a how to, this is not, uh, information that that you will actually use in your writing that's not the point of this video there are a bajillion and one of those videos out there i would totally recommend just searching around see what you can find but i'm sure you're doing that that's probably why you're here so on top of that what has taken me significantly more work than actually filming and making this video is creating a pretty big uh, spreadsheet on google docs that i am going to spell all of this out and make it sort of digestible for you, make it a little bit more easy to comprehend. Uh, visually, I think it'll make much more sense to see sort of a natural order of progression of things. And I'm going to leave, I have, I've already started making a ton of different playlists of YouTube videos that fall under certain categories of things that will help you, uh, links to websites, links to textbooks, all that sort of stuff. I really think particularly for the beginner, it will be a great place to start. And I'm not, this isn't like me selling some, I, I don't know, I'm worried that people are going to assume I'm selling something. I'm not. I, there is no sales pitch here. <laughs> there, this is purely just because I wanted this video at the beginning. I wanted to be told bluntly. I didn't want people to shy away from telling me, you know, basically like, you're not good enough at this. If you want to get good at this, you need to get good at this specifically. I needed to hear that. I wanted to hear that. So I want to make this for people who also need to hear that. So the, the link to that spreadsheet will be the first one in the description. I will pin it in the comments. I'm going to uh, have it in every description of every YouTube video I make forever. I want, my, my goal is to create a community of beginner, intermediate, even up to advanced composers who are maybe sending in suggestions. I want the thing to constantly be growing and I'm gonna be adding videos to playlists I want this to be a place to start. And so that for people who are committed to this, who are willing to put in the time, they don't have to spend half their time looking for the right tutorial. They can just spend their time actually studying and getting better. And I want to be a part of that community that you know comes together to try and learn. Because the reality is, is that even if I give you a full length college syllabus, will be helpful in getting you to where you need to go. But if you don't put in the work, it's 
absolutely meaningless. Knowing how to write music without ever having played an instrument or opened a DAW before is gonna get you absolutely nowhere. So this stuff takes practice. I don't think that I'm you know, making this too accessible for anyone. It, you still have to put in the work. There are no shortcuts, there are no magic tricks. No matter how many times someone tells you something, no matter how many times you learn something, until you start implementing it and practicing it in your own pieces of music, you're not gonna get better at it. And that's the unfortunate truth of pretty much any skill. And I think on some level, we all know that. So I don't think I'm, you know, break, you know shattering anyone's mind with, with that. I just wanted to get it out of the way. Hopefully that clears up any questions people have. Please do uh, click that link on the video in the description. It is like kind of like the main point of this video is I want people to be checking that out. Uh, and if you have comments on how I could improve it, uh, you know, leave a comment on the YouTube video or send me an email, I've got my email uh, on that. Okay, now the fun part, kind of, sort of, I still need to say a few quick things before we get to the fun part, if you will. Um, in the beginning, one thing that was really intimidating to me was I felt like I couldn't get clear answers on some very basic tech stuff. So if you are one of those people who is confused about MIDI controllers, MIDI keyboards, audio interfaces, studio monitors, you know, RAM, external hard drives, that kind of stuff. I want to answer the very basics, just rapid fire without explanation. I'll leave links, you know, I'll, I'll leave an infinite number of links in the description to, you know, forums, posts, whatever, talking about this stuff and giving you the reason as to why Th this is really just a here are the answers. Um, so for your computer, you at the bare minimum should be starting with 16 gigs of RAM. It's going to be really hard to find libraries that are going to function well on eight gigs, let alone if you're trying to use convolution reverbs, if you're trying to use multiple libraries, it's just, you're going to be so frustrated by your computer's inability to keep up with what you're writing that it's going to make you want to quit. So I think 16 is like the bare, bare minimum. I have 32 on my laptop. And for what I do, it mostly gets me there. I still, at some point in the future, would absolutely love, you know, my next computer, I'm going to make sure I upgrade in RAM. Um, but 32, particularly for a beginner, is, is, is more than enough. It's just when you're in that 4, 8 range, you're going to have problems. The computer's just not going to be able to keep up. So secondly, uh, another big question that I had, and this is one I didn't realize until very recently that I screwed up on. Buy a solid state drive as your external drive, not a hard disk drive. The solid state drive will just be much faster. It's more expensive. That's why I didn't buy it in the first place, but I didn't think there was a difference. When you store your samples on an external drive, the drive matters in its ability to, um, you know, give the give the info, give the data back into the into the GUI of your plugin. And to be able to do that quickly and I was about to say accurately as if there's like inaccurate, that doesn't make sense. Quickly and sort of, you know, in its purest form to really sound the way the sample is meant to sound, solid state drive is where you want to go. Um, you know, particularly for a beginner, if you haven't bought uh, any sample libraries yet, you could probably start with just one terabyte and see where that gets you. But definitely don't be storing your sample. Don't make a routine of storing your samples on your computer itself. It will slow things down. And if you can afford it, buy the solid state drive because a lot of the clicks and pops that might be coming up in your DAW that you might think are a RAM problem might actually be the problem I had, which was that I was using a hard disk drive. And as I uh, upgraded to this solid state drive, pretty recently, like in the past couple of weeks, I have noticed a massive boost in performance in my DAW without obviously changing anything else about my computer. Uh, speaking of DAWs, you need a DAW. Yeah, I'm not gonna say anymore. <laughs> uh, MIDI keyboard, if you're working in a tight room, uh, whatever your workspace is, I would say, sh try and see if you can organize things in such a way that you don't have to go any lower than 49 keys for your MIDI keyboard. 61 is like, awesome and 88 like the full piano is it certainly won't hurt you i'm lucky enough to have room in my sort of at home studio where i can fit an 88 key keyboard and i love it i like ha feeling like i'm sort of actually playing a full piano um there's something about that to me that's just rewarding but for writing in and playing in parts 61 keys is more than enough um the two things to pay attention for are one get 
one that either has semi-weighted or fully weighted keys. The fully weighted is going to be more expensive, but it's going to feel like you're actually playing a piano. The semi-weighted, you'll still feel some resistance, um, but it won't quite have that same feel of a piano. The reason that's important, if you don't already know, is that velocity for a plethora of reasons is really important when it comes to programming orchestral scores, mock-ups. Um, so yeah, you need a keyboard, it needs to have a mod wheel, and I would really save the money to be able to buy one that has semi-weighted or fully weighted keys. It's going to save you so much time not having to, every time you play something into your DAW, having to go in and change like half of the velocities because the keyboard didn't, you know, sense them correctly. You know, cheap MIDI keyboards, my first one that I ever bought was like a $30, you know, little tiny one with plastic, which is great for when I'm traveling. It's better, it's way better than not having anything, but the problem with it is it's so inconsistent with the sensitivity to velocity that randomly there'll be one that's at full velocity when I'm trying to play in like the piano range. Um, and that obviously like you can't have it be misreading your velocities that much. Uh, it'll just cause problems. So yeah, get one. Uh, if you can, 61 keys is great. Semi-weighted, fully weighted. I said I wasn't going to spend much time explaining why and I've done exactly that. So I'm sorry I'm going slowly. Um, I will rapid rapid fire the next three because I'm throwing these. I'm putting those first four in sort of a needs category. I think that those are crucial. You need the keyboard for the sense of realism. Drawing stuff in is going to sound like a robot made your music and it's going to sound terrible and it's going to be just bleh. Um, and it, all, it, it will save you so much damn time when you're playing things on a, uh, in on a keyboard. I'll get more into that once we get into the actual skills. Okay, so real, real rapid quick, rapid quick here. Um, MIDI fader, MIDI controller. This is great because then you can control more than just your mod wheel. You can assign MIDI data to multiple faders. I'm assuming if you got into film music, orchestral music, you're sort of familiar with this concept of dynamic expression, vibrato, all these things that you need to program in. And having a dedicated fader that, or MIDI controller that has multiple faders so that you can do all of them at once, it just gonna save you a ton of time. But it's not necessary uh, if you're just starting way more important to get a MIDI keyboard that has a mod wheel. If you're just programming the mod wheel data, particularly if you're a beginner, that's gonna be more than enough. Um, but once you're moving into that intermediate advanced stage, getting a separate MIDI controller is probably gonna be worth your money. All right, headphone studio monitors. Obviously this is a need. I assume anyone who has any interest in making music knows this, but it's very personal. And the more you up in quality, there's, there's sort of real diminishing returns. And on top of that, it's like, multiplied by the fact that in order to notice that difference, it takes a lot of ear training. In other words, you need to have been doing this for years and years and years. So I'm putting this in the want because, you know, if you're if you're a be true beginner at this, even in that in-between beginner intermediate phase, you know, if you have a $100, $150 pair of headphones, then that's not going to be the thing that's holding you back. Um, really, it's, it's when it gets time to mix. It's nice to have studio monitors. It's nice to have a treated room. It's nice to have headphones to reference on. That's all great. Not necessarily in the beginning. It's a want. Uh, other thing that's a want, but also basically a need is an audio interface. At some point down the line, you're going to need one. Uh, just the computer, you know, I'm not going to take the time to explain why. There's a billion videos on the internet about that. I'll link one or two in the description maybe. Okay, so now <laughs> that I've sped through that and I probably have like 10 minutes or more of <laughs> video before we've even gotten to the actual substance, which is like, you know, if you're making YouTube videos, that's not how they say to do it. Anyways, um, so I was sorry if I was speaking really fast there. I was doing my best to try and get through it. I have a tendency to ramble, ramble, ramble. Okay, so here's the four part, the four part, the fun part, the four skills that you need to know that everything you practice should fall under one of these four skills in order to best increase your chances of turning this into a profession. If that is your goal, is to write music for film, TV, video game, media of any kind, I think, I think that you need these four things. Some people are gonna disagree. Professionals might disagree with me and I'm not a professional. So keep that in mind. Think of this more not as rules that you have to follow 100%, but as um, sort of a, you know, being honest with yourself about the fact that the vast majority of us are not prodigies. We don't have perfect pitch. We can't just improvise, you know, beautiful harmonic chord progressions without any training. 
And training could be just messing around on the piano for days and days and hours and hours and hours. And eventually you'll stumble across some cool stuff that still is implementing music theory, even if you don't know the technical language for it. That's still theory. Um, but these four things are going to be worth your time in practice, going to be worth their weight in gold, to use that stupid phrase. Um, <laughs> I don't know if gold is worth anything anymore. Does anyone know if gold is worth anything anymore? I don't know. Um, but the, getting good at these four things, here's the point. Getting good at these four things is going to best get, give you the best chances of turning this into a job. Um, you know, you get good at the music first and then you go from there. And I think that these four things, if you are intermediate to advanced in all four of them, then you are in a great position to write some really awesome music. So number one, uh, is number one, <laughs> I'm over here. Number one is uh, piano. And that's probably a little controversial to have as number one. And look, technically speaking, it's not really the first most important thing is your piano skills. Here's why I'm putting it number one, because if you're anything like me, <laughs> you'll do anything in your power not to practice. <laughs> and it's so much more fun to be in your DAW, drawing around, trying to get something that resembles somewhat close to the sound that you're going for, you're writing, and you don't have, you don't have the patience to sit there and learn each part before you could play it in. So you do lots of drawing in and then you end up not really practicing much piano and just saying, oh, I'll just get there when I get there. And here's the reason why I put it number one. It's because I want it to be in your brain that this is something that 10, 15 minutes a day of practice three to five times a week and six months from now, the number of things you're gonna be able to play into your DAW, it, it's just going to be a game changer for, your, for the quality of your compositions. I would still very much describe myself somewhere between beginner and intermediate and my piano skills. It is one of the things that I am forcing myself, frankly, to practice every day because the music I can create in my DAW is way more interesting and way more fun for me than the music I can play on piano. I'm still doing the basic like, dun -na -na, dun -na -na, dun -dun, like one, lots of one note, maybe two note chords. And like, but theory wise, I, my brain is so far past that, that it's frustrating, but I'm trying to force myself to do it. I want people to, if you can, to force yourself to do it. And here's the other thing. It's, it's only a force in the beginning, right? As is with learning any instrument. I, I think almost anyone out there, regardless of how musically inclined they are, if you could just like wake up one day and be in the intermediate advanced range at playing guitar and you'd never played a guitar before, you all of a sudden would really enjoy playing guitar, right? It's the beginning of any skill. It's the beginning of learning to create music in your DAW. It's the beginning of learning to play an instrument. That is the boring part. And you gotta just keep pushing through it because It'll give you a sense of realism that you just frankly can't get from drawing in the notes. I mean, you technically can, but it, for all intents and purposes, you can't get it from just drawing in the notes. And number two, this is the biggest one that is talked about a little bit less online. It is going to speed up your workflow more than anything else you learn. Time is an, I, I think it's not talked about enough, the importance of being efficient in your producing. When you are motivated, when you're feeling inspired, nothing will kill that motivation and inspiration faster than having to draw in every part, having to meticulously draw in the dynamics, the expression, the vibrato, you know, automate your reverb, whatever. If you're doing all of that manually, one by one by one by one by one by one by one, it's going to take you an hour to get five seconds of music and you're going to be like, all right, great. I had this cool idea in my head, but all I've got to show for it is five seconds. Yeah, I'm bored. You know, I'm going to close this project and never open it again, even though the idea behind it might have actually been really good. So being able to get stuff down quickly, being able to sketch quickly and efficiently and in one sort of session, being able to get a fair amount of stuff down because you just can keep playing stuff in is an, is one of the most valuable skills you can have. And, you know, when the day comes where you're doing this professionally, it's just a reality of the business from, you know, every course I've taken online, every video I've watched of listening to people who are working professionals, that you're never not under a time crunch. Speed is always of the essence. So practice your piano and don't just practice by saying, oh, I'll just play in more parts than usual when I'm composing next time. No, set aside, it can be 10 minutes a damn day to just practice the piano for five days a week. You don't need to become the next, you know, 
piano prodigy player, but just getting to an intermediate phase even will will ha- it there just everything about learning piano is be- going to be beneficial to your compositions. Um, and on side note, it's going to force you to learn how to read sheet music, which again. Not what everyone wants to hear, but I'm going to tell you right now, you should learn how to read sheet music and you should learn how to study scores via their sheet music, if that makes any sense. Okay, number two, um, this is the one where everyone, if anyone's still watching, is likely going to click off. But I am before I say it, and I've already sort of hinted at it multiple times, um, I think that this is, in reality of actual importance, you know, I, I gave my reasoning for why piano was at number one when it really isn't technically number one. I think that this is number one. And there are working professionals who say they don't know any theory. It, you know, not to give it away. It's it's music theory. Music theory is what you've, you've got to get really good at it. And before you click off, I'm not going to go on a long rant about how, you know, interesting it's really actually really interesting if you get into it like i actually do think it is but that's not how you get people to change their mind on it just give me like a couple of minutes to give you you know a a sort of thought experiment a way of thinking about this that maybe you haven't heard before and i really think it might motivate you to take this seriously now here's maybe my hottest take or whatever i don't know There are working professionals who say they don't know any music theory. I call, I don't know, I guess I can't swear on YouTube. I call BS on that. And here's why. I'm not saying they're they're directly lying or even that they're knowingly lying. They're not really lying. But I think that, you know, working professionals, composers who do this for a living, regardless, what they're telling you is that they don't know the technical lingo. But if you write interesting orchestral music, you have to know theory. Whether and that that's not just like you know dominant seven sharp five flat seven. I mean, I'm making up totally fake chords here. Um, it's not just about that stuff. It's not learning more fancy chords. So much of it is the structure of what you're doing that will just, it will, I promise you, once you begin to to think about it in perhaps a different way, it'll totally change your experience with making music. Um, So I just want to be blunt with you. Like getting better at music theory has been in combination with learning orchestration, which is, you know, I'm not doing a great job of (laughs) hiding these until I actually reveal them, which is number three. But it, like really taking it seriously. I've been doing music. It's just music has been a part of my life since well before 2015. I don't even remember the year I started, but for anyone who, you know, you can go back and look at my old videos. EDM was the thing I did for the vast majority of the time. Right at the beginning of uh, C Word, I, something clicked. And the sort of this obsession I had with sort of like the f- fantasy aspect of like what was the melodic house melodic dubstep all that you know airwave music tv the uh, no copyright sounds that stuff so much of what i loved about it was this emotional ability this ability to tell a story and give emotion through music and a lot of it didn't have vocals it wasn't traditional like pop songs and so it was always harmony and melody and you know production that allowed you to tell that story. And I loved that about music and explaining to people that for a large portion of my life, the majority of the music I listen to doesn't have lyrics is something that a lot of people don't understand. But I think that a lot of people who are interested in film music have that same feeling towards music. They want to like have that feeling of closing your eyes and just getting the sort of like chills from a chord change or, you know, something like that. And theory is going to do this for you. It's going to get you there. Okay, here's going to be my quick pitch as to why studying theory is worth your time. Music theory, if I, I, this is geared towards people who have, you know, really are true beginners, haven't spent much time really studying traditional theory. Um, no matter what your skill is musically, you could be really skilled musically, but if you don't know any theory, this section of the video, I'll put chapters and all that mumbo jumbo, is geared towards that person. So here's my 
pitch to you, my sort of sales pitch, if you will. Um, we all know in the beginning, it sounds like a foreign language. There's all sorts of technical lingo that unfortunately you just sort of got to memorize, but the more you hear it, it you just, you, you pick it up fast. Um, and we all know that feeling at some point in our lives, unless we were doing music seriously from a very young age, if you're like me, you know, you see a video from someone like a guy, Mitchell Moore, whose channel I love was one of the channels I first started watching titled like chromatic medians, the, the, you know, the skill that film composers use all the time to give you that cinematic sound. And he's like explaining it throughout the video. And I'm like, yeah, I like the sound of what he's doing. I can't do that. But I, I couldn't even, I couldn't understand the basic terminology he was using. And it was so frustrating and so demoralizing to me that, you know, the longest periods I've gone of sort of like giving up on this thing have been that exact, have been caused by that exact thing. The demoralization and the demotivation of listening to someone who does it professionally speak a language that I can't understand, and I don't even know where to start understanding it. So I say all that just to say to you, I feel like I understand that feeling. I know that music theory people sometimes can be a little bit rude and pretentious and condescending about it, as is the case with anyone who's really good at anything, right? But... I don't want to be that person. I want to be very clear. Just because I know what a chromatic median is, I don't think I'm a better composer than someone who doesn't. And it very well could be the case that they're taking advantage of that just without knowing the technical language. That's sort of the whole point of what I'm getting at here is um, <laughs> the thing about music theory, if you allow me to, I studied philosophy in college, <laughs> if you allow me to go a little philosophical for just a second. The thing about music theory is that you gotta stop hyper focusing on music theory. And what I mean by that is, uh, I can describe this pretty quickly. Think of anything you're technically skilled at, anything in the world, um, or, or even better, think of a time where you were, you know, maybe this hasn't happened to you, but I'm sure you can imagine it happening. Uh, you were in a conversation with someone, you were in a position somewhere for some reason where someone who was really technically skilled at something had an assumption that you were, you know, on, you know, that you, that you were relatively on their skill level. So they were speaking to you in such a way, assuming you knew lots of technical language that maybe you knew none of. And at a certain point in the conversation, you can't hide it anymore. You got to just be like, I don't even know. You just like made sounds at me for two minutes. And they're like, uh, oh, sorry, my bad. Now, there are some people who are jerks about it and some people who get off on the fact that they like know something that someone else doesn't, which is, you know, everyone sort of has an ego. I get the feeling of wanting to you know, be smarter than someone else, but it, like, who cares, man? I, you know, I, I'm certainly not going to win a pitch, you know, to score a film because I can, you know, wait, quick, I can recite the definition of, x term you know it's not the point of this um so <laughs> the point i'm getting at there is that if you ever like stopped learning trying to learn music theory because it sounds too confusing because you feel like you're too dumb for it you're not too dumb you're not too impatient for it if you love music and you want to do this for a living or if you just want to do it just for the sake of doing it which is just as valid if not more of a valid of a reason for doing it just remember you're not dumb you're not too impatient you're simply putting unrealistic expectations on yourself that you would never place on someone else. You're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna be able to follow, uh, what's that chemistry course that like everyone fails out of? That was gonna be my example, a college chem course. There's some chem course. Whatever, it, you know, you're not gonna show up to calculus class after just graduating from elementary school and be able to follow and it's not because the fifth grader is dumb <laughs> you to make an assumption that the fifth grader is dumb because they can't keep up with calculus would be insane so I've, I, I think you all get what i'm saying at this point just don't be harsh on yourselves this stuff takes time as is the case with anything right um so all that out the way here's my pitch if you are someone who's been making music for a while, in your DAW, whatever the case may be, 
at some point or another, if you've been avoiding music theory, I'm guessing you've heard this argument or you've thought of it yourself, the, the sort of, I don't need to learn music theory because it's just a set of rules to sound like anyone else and it'll limit my creativity. I, there aren't many things in, in the world of music, the musical discourse, if you will, uh, that, that I just really get upset at. That This is one of them. And the reason I get so mad about it and the reason I hate it so much is not because it's like super dumb or anything like that, but it's because it's super, it, it seems so intuitively, you know, logically sound. It, it seems to make so much sense on face value. And so for me, for so long, it held me back from pushing myself into a position where I was uncomfortable to try and really get serious about learning this stuff. And it was an avoidance technique that I could just be like, oh yeah, no, it'll just, it'll just restrict my creativity. I don't want to know, you know, I don't want to be told which chord has to follow which chord. I just want to figure it out on my own and see what sounds best. Now, here, here's my very quick way of, of, of showing that that argument is a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo, n absolute nonsense. At some point in your life, if you've been making music in a digital audio workstation or a DAW, you have probably gone onto YouTube and searched uh, tips for EQing better. Uh, you know, how to use compression, how to use sidechain compression, how to use reverb, how do I use delay, how do I use saturation, how do I use distortion, uh, when to use return tracks and parallel processing, I, you know, tutorials about the stereo field and, you know, when it makes sense to put something in mono or when do you mix in mid, on and on and on and on about mixing theory, right? Now, does watching any of these videos or getting better at any of those skills restrict your creative freedom when it comes to writing songs? N no, no. It, in fact, it does the exact opposite. It's not just that it's not true. It, it's like the polar opposite of what's true. Because the thing about music is that there aren't right answers. That's not how music works. If it was, then there would be, you know, an AI, you know, there'd be some company somewhere creating an AI to make music that they could monetize. There aren't correct answers to music. That's not how this works. Instead, we are all trying to solve a sort of unsolvable problem. Rather, and maybe a better way of putting it is that we're all trying to solve a problem which has an infinite number of solutions. And the problem is very simple. How do I make something that is enjoyable to listen to. On some level, that's what this all comes down to, right? And to get there, there are a lot of things that need to come together to create something that we enjoy listening to, that people enjoy listening to. Now, let's imagine you're someone who's, let's just say, you know, you're someone who's been uh, making, you know, hip hop trap beats, you've been making pop music, you've been making, making EDM, you've been making, it could be film music, it could be anything. And you've been doing it in your DAW, or you've just been singer songwriting with your guitar, piano, whatever, whatever you've been doing. But particularly if you've been working in your DAW for maybe five years, right? And think of it this way. When you go to EQ something, why are you going to EQ? You are going to an EQ to solve a problem, which for the most part is like, I don't like that frequency. <laughs> I, I want to get rid of it. I want to add more of that, whatever, you know, on, on its most basic use. That's what an EQ does, right? That's solving a musical problem to get us closer to a desired sound, closer to uh one of the infinite possible solutions that could be implemented to get you to where you want to go. Now, let's say, you know, so imagine you don't even have to really imagine, just follow the thought, the, the, the thinking here, any problem that comes up in the songwriting, music, making, composing process, mixing, master anywhere along the line, when a problem comes up, what differentiates the like skilled pros from the new beginners is that we can think of significantly more ways of solving that fundamental problem of how do I get from where this is now closer to it being 
and something that's enjoyable to listen to. So the skilled mixer, for example, someone who mixes other people's audio for a living, they can both hear the audio in a slightly different way, but really what differentiates them is their ability to have to think of a lot of different potential solutions to that problem. And so they might test different ones. They might have an idea based off of prior experience of which ones might be good for trying here, there, or the other thing. But, you know, if you're a beginner producer and you've got some bass and you want it to punch a little more, the only, you know, you might only have one solution in your head, which is to jump to an EQ or to, you know, maybe you have two. Jump to an EQ, boost the low end, or add some distortion. And, you know, a beginner, those very reasonably might be the only two ways you could think of giving some boost, some life, some edge to a bass sound. Whereas, you know, the, someone, the working professional who's been doing this for years knows that those are two options, also knows that parallel processing, sorry, that parallel processing, English, that parallel processing is a totally valid option and that you could, you know, slam some parallel compression on there and all of a sudden your bass might be really punching, you know, if you want your drums to be more thumpy, whatever, you know, parallel, I, I use parallel processing just because I think it's a great example of a of something that can solve problems that a lot of beginners intermediates don't know about. And it's not just that they don't know about it, but they don't even have the con ability to conceptualize, you know, how that could be used, how it could be used to solve problems. And so the beginner, the beginner musician, when presented with X problem, might be able to think of five ways to solve it. Whereas the experienced professional, whatever, can maybe can think of a hundred ways to solve it. That is what music theory will do for you. It does not tell you the answer because there are, there's not, there's never one right answer. There's an infinite number of right answers. Instead, it gives, it opens up more tools for you, gives you more tools in the toolbox to solve the problem of, of, of getting closer to that music that is enjoyable to listen to. So that is my pitch for why music theory is worth your time. And so in the, it, it's just, it's value cannot be overstated. Uh, it's going to not just, is it not going to limit your creativity? It's going to give you so many creative options that you did not know were even remotely possible. So it is not just that that original argument is bad or wrong. It's in fact, it's the dead opposite. And so when, uh, when your goal is, okay, I've got this chord progression that's pretty good. You know, maybe it's diatonic. It's just sticking in one key. And you're like, I like it, but I want it to have a more of a feeling of X, right? The beginner composer might reach to other instruments, might think about changing tempo, might even think about maybe changing some of the orchestration. Maybe, you know, maybe we're going to switch to a, you know, a, a ostinato pattern for the strings instead of just long sustains, it, whatever it is. They've got all these problems. Or they, they've got those are the solutions they've got in their head as to how to achieve that. Whereas the more experienced composer might will will be able to think of all those things, and maybe one of those is a great solution. But on top of it, they might say, "All right, um, you know, let me take advantage of thinking about some solutions that involve a little bit more technically advanced music theory. Let me try using a chromatic median." Uh, what about using a secondary dominant here? What about borrowing chords from, you know, uh, 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 you know, parallel keys and, uh, you know, modal mixture and all the on and on and on we go with the technical whatever. But so here's the point is that it's never telling you this is when you have to use a seven chord or, you know, th that's not what music theory is. It never is that way. It gives you examples of music which take advantage of said piece of theory to solve a problem. It's not telling you, okay, here's this chord progression, just copy this, and now you're a musician. Like that, it's not how it works. It's, it's opening up your mind to different tools, different options which are available to you. So that is my long pitch on music theory. And it was long, and this video is gonna end up being way longer than I wanted it to be. But I really, really just cannot stress this enough. It's worth your time. And again, on the spreadsheet that I'm making, there's going to be links to great places to start. 
because I'm going to link a website. I'm going to link, I, I know I have a, you know, a, a playlist of YouTube videos, whatever, just as a starting place, because it's so intimidating, all this technical language, and you're trying to learn all of it and you don't know where to go. You don't know which order to go really in the beginning, starting with something and committing to something that maybe isn't quite as fun, but that follows a very structured path from beginner to intermediate into the advanced stuff is going to be so worth your time if you can just i'm going to link one specific youtube channel to check out is a yale professor named seth monahan he has all the videos on his channel except for like his first one are part of this series of like classical theory or i, I don't remember the, his name for it but it's like exactly what people who want to write film music in my opinion need and it's super simple Episode one, episode two, episode three, all the way up to like episode 36 or something. If you can just commit to watch one video a day in a little over a month, you are going to be intermediate. You, get, you are going to have at bare minimum an intermediate understanding of music theory. And then from there, understanding some of the connections between different aspects of theory, you're going to have a much better time when you're watching a, maybe the more fun, really specific, in-depth niche tutorials on a specific subject, you're going to be able to draw it back to the general theory and then really know how to implement it. So that is a great place to start if it's intimidating. I'm going to have links on that spreadsheet. They're going to be links up the wazoo. So please do go check that out. Um, number three, which I have already mentioned, uh, orchestration. And I'm going to try and be much quicker with this than the music theory. Orchestration and music theory are obviously remarkably in intertwined. <laughs> they, they go hand in hand. And in so many cases, it is kind of iffy, whether a skill falls under theory or orchestration, like isn't orchestration theory, it can be confusing. And I'm not here to try and draw a hard line between the two. What I am here to tell you is that it's important to make a mental distinction between the two. Because although they're totally intertwined, um, you know, think about, uh, you know, Mixing and mastering, which maybe isn't the best analogy, but just for the purpose of what I'm saying here, they are obviously remarkably intertwined. They go hand in hand. You have to have a good mix to have a good master. You have to have a good, well, you don't have to have a good master to have a good mix. Anyways, you get the kind of point that I'm getting at, right? They go hand in hand, but to think of them as the same thing probably is going to hold you back. So, and this took a while for me. I, in my head, orchestration was just a sub part of music theory. In a way, it kind of is. But even if that's the case, even if that's how you want to define it, thinking of it as something separate is going to absolutely change the way you write film music. Um, the first place I would start is Ryan Leach. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name correctly, and it's not like a hard C or something. But um, his channel is one of my absolute favorites. If you have not, please, please, please go watch his videos. Subscribe. You will learn so, 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 so much. Um, but he has a series back towards the beginning of his channel where he covers George Frederick McKay's eight orchestral textures and where he takes the same melody and the same harmony, except for the monophonic texture um, for reasons that you would understand when you go watch the video, but the same melody and the same harmony and he orchestrates them in eight different ways according to the eight different orchestral textures that... George McKay lays out. And so if you don't have a clear concept of what orchestration is, how it really differs, differs from music theory, go watch that series. It will be some of the best use of your time because all of a sudden you'll realize that, that uh, you know, the way that orchestral music comes together is a lot less random than it might seem, and that at almost all times, you know, pretty much every piece of film music, orchestral music you listen to, no matter where you are in the piece, the composer is taking advantage of one of those eight textures. And it just, it really will be a massive help to you. And if you find those videos to be super interesting, there's a lot more um, on Ryan's channel. I have a link to a playlist I've made all about orchestration orchestrating for strings, orchestrating for woodwinds, orchestrating for brass, orchestrating for the whole orchestra, all of it uh, on that uh, Google sheet that I made. Um, but definitely the place I would start there because it gives you a very clear un understanding of how orchestration differs from, let's say, harmonic theory. Uh, they're, they're very different things, but the orchestration is like 
it, it's so fun when you when you really start to realize what it means and that you know how important it is to be very strategic and specific about how you voice chords, how you know taking advantage of voice leading, all this stuff. So that's where it obviously intertwines with the music theory stuff. But um, you know, getting good at orchestration. If you if if you have it in you to read a textbook, George Frederick McKay's textbook that I'm almost done with now uh, is an absolutely awesome read. Um, so yeah, go check out. I'm going to link that playlist to to Ryan's videos. Uh, I'm also I also have a link to it on the spreadsheet that I made. Um, yeah, so orchestration orchestration, if I haven't made it clear already, is the art of writing for the orchestra and recognizing the fact that the number of instruments and players you have at your fingertips is both awesome, but on the flip side of things, you have to be very strategic with how you write because, just because the orchestral instruments work together really well in a piece of music that you really like doesn't mean that they will necessarily always work together well unless you're strategic about how you orchestrate them. You know, in the same way that in if you're making an EDM track, you frankly can't have like seven different sounds un unless they're meant to sort of sound as one. But you can't have like seven different unique bass sounds. It'll get too muddy. And this was one where like I misunderstood what orchestration was in the beginning where i thought the big climax the crescendo of my piece meant that the 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 bass line was being played by the basses and the strings it was being played you know in unison by the tuba it was being played in unison by the bassoon i thought that that's what that meant and maybe there are times you might want to try that a lot of the time you probably don't because the low end will get too money that's an example of what orchestration is and it's really fun it's it's so much fun. So yeah, number three is orchestration. Um, just you know that the the practice of orchestration really is going to come in your composing. Uh, that's just going to come along the way. But being conscious of it is 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 really important, and it's frankly just really fun. So I had a lot more stuff written, but this video is already going to be like an hour long already, which is yeah. Um, so anyways, I'm just going to quickly move on to number four, which is sort of. I don't even know what to call this, but it's like mixing, mixing, mastering, general audio knowledge. Your essentially what I'm getting at here is your skill set in your digital audio workstation. Although mixing orchestral music is significantly different than mixing a pop track, still knowing how compression works, knowing the you know the theory of EQing, of reverb, of delay, all the all the good stuff, right, is going to at some point or another, I. Uh, pay massive dividends in your orchestral writing. Working with samples, unfortunately, is never gonna be the same as working with real players. So taking advantage of what our digital audio workstations have to offer us is um, something that if you're good at, is gonna one, save you a lot of time, two, you know, get you closer to the sound that you want. Uh, if it's something that you can't just achieve through orchestration and through your use of theory. Um, so being good within your DAW. Um, anyways, so, but just, just sort of having all of that stuff down um, on some level, continuing to grow in your knowledge of that and, ooh, voice crack. Um, but, <laughs> uh, you know, there, there are a bajillion videos on YouTube. Uh, the, the first channel I would recommend is, uh, I believe his, the name of his channel is In The Mix. Um, he has some really awesome videos, particularly for beginners. Like, what does compression sound like? What does what should what should compression sound like? Like, what are all the different types of EQs? What are all the different types of compressors? A great place to get you into some of that stuff. Although I certainly do think that it's fourth on the. It comes at a definitive fourth on this list, which isn't to say it's important. It's one of the big four skills. Um, you know, your job is working with audio. And so being good at the workstation, the audio workstation is really valuable. But if you're trying to write film music, don't mean squat. If you're a professional in Ableton, if you have very limited understanding of theory orchestration and you're maybe don't have any piano skills, it's gonna be really hard to make good music, even if you really are pro, you know, as a mixing or audio engineer or something like that. Um, of course, if your goal is to just be an audio engineer and be someone who mixes masters mix, mixes, then that's where you want to spend the majority of your time. But I'm assuming if, if you're still watching to this point in the video, you're more interested in the composition. Um, so that's the four skills. 
make sure that what you're practicing, ask yourself the question, is what I'm practicing one of these four skills? Now, I, I have a feeling one of the first questions that's going to come up maybe in some people's minds, um, and I want to just make this distinction very clear if it has come up in your mind, I'm not telling you to stop playing other instruments. Uh, please, for the love of God, don't stop playing other instruments. The more instruments, the absolute better. I just was specific about piano just because if it's not part of your current regimen and you have a MIDI keyboard available to you, it's just as much as maybe you don't want to or you've been blowing it off or whatever the reason, just setting aside specific piano time is really going to be worth your time. But the more music, the merrier. So just if that was unclear, I want to get that out of the way. Um, and so I do want to make a follow-up video. It might just be one. It might be multiple. I'm not sure yet. I still need to plan it out because this video is going to end up being way longer than I thought it was. Um, my goal was to sort of do a whole video on like, here are the skills you need. I think doing one long video here at the beginning where I'm just talking about what the skills are and then maybe next week I'll do a video um, going a little bit more in depth on the, you know, some of the subcategories of, of the theory, then one on orchestration and so on and so forth will be worth your time. But because I do not want to cause the problem that can be a problem with YouTube videos in information overload and getting demoralized and making you want to give up, I'm going to stop the video here. And if you're still here, um, good for you. I, I, I really do think, I, I'm not sure I've presented new information, but I think that consciously being aware of these four things in how you think about your practicing and really do think of your time making music as practice. And if you spend four hours a day in your DAW, can you, are you willing to spend one of those four hours uh, split up between maybe 20 minutes of reading some theory, 20 minutes of practicing piano, and 20 minutes of reading some orchestration theory, whatever it is, um, can you can you dedicate a little bit of your time? Because over time, it's going to pay massive, massive, massive dividends. So again, please do check out the spreadsheet in the description. It'll be way more organized than I am. My brain is not, when it comes to trying to speak this stuff, not nearly as organized. I think it's going to make way more sense if you check that out. So um, if you haven't watched... The whole video, if you've skipped to the end, I, I, I'm going to put this clip even at the very beginning. Like, even if you don't want to watch the video, totally get it. Totally understand who wants to listen to some person rant in front of a microphone for, I don't know, it's probably an hour at this point. Um, check out that spreadsheet. I, I want that to be like the hub. That's my goal is uh, to grow this thing, to, to, to make this accessible for people so that the, 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 the problem of knowing what should I even try to learn um, hopefully will no longer be a problem for some people. So, uh, if this was helpful, if you enjoyed it, if you have any, um, you know, feedback as to how the video in the future could be more helpful, anything. Um, my goal here with this YouTube channel really is to just, if not build my own community, sort of join this community of people working together and really take advantage of the fact that there are lots of people who are really interested in that, in this stuff. And they don't all necessarily live right next door to me. And I want to be a part of that community. I want to contribute in ways, in whatever ways that I can. And I know that if I do that, and if I put in that work, that I'm going to reap the rewards of, you know, dissecting other people's brains, hearing feedback from other people, um, so yeah, really, you know, I, this is not coming from a place of like trying to sell you a course or monetize the video or anything like that. It, it's, it's really just looking to, to, you know, join, join the community, if you will, uh, the, <laughs> the community to sort of, you know, become a part of that, that, that joke won't make any sense to anyone, but, <laughs> um, Yeah. So anyways, I'm rambling at this point. I don't have any new information to say. Uh, thank you for watching. Please do subscribe. I'm going to have more content moving forward, going more in depth into what the subcategories are of these, of these four skills and maybe how to strategize going about studying them. And yeah, I think I'll end it there and I'll just end it very quickly with try your best, try your absolute best, not to think about what you do not know yet, but to constantly be reminding yourself of what you have learned and how far you have come. And think about someone who has never opened a DAW before in all 
of the things you could explain to them if they were so interested. You all know a lot. You are interested in music. We all love music. It, you know, in danger of sounding just absolutely, unbelievably cheesy, it's something that I really fully believe is purposeful. In other words, it gives me purpose in life. Music does. I think it's that valuable to the human experience. And so trying not to be harsh on ourselves because we haven't learned enough fast enough and because it seems like everyone else around us knows more than us, just know and try and remember, or at least hear it from me if it means anything, that you're not alone. I know a fair amount of theory now because I've put in the time, but I would be lying if I said I still don't struggle every single day with feeling like I don't know enough and with feeling like I'm too dumb, too impatient, don't have the real drive to do this, like the people who are making music that's better than mine. That being said, if I played the first piece of orchestral music I've ever written back to back with the stuff I've been working on recently, the difference is nothing short of remarkable. But that's because I've put in the time and it's because I want to do that. Um, you don't have to put in as much time as I have to get better. Any amount of time, any amount of time with consistency, you'll see results. So uh, until next time, thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Take care.